Hi! Welcome to another Snappy Dragon sewing video, but in this one, I'm gonna actually make something from this century. My best friend's birthday happened earlier this month, and let me tell you all a little bit about my best friend, who I will call Sasscat. She is an absolute badass. She's been a ballet dancer for pretty much her whole life, and she's been on point for 18, 19 years, which is longer than most people still have feet that can be on point. She's super amazing. It's, it's so awesome. She's also been super encouraging of my interest in ballet, which is much, much more recent than 18, 19 years. It's not even 18, 19 months. Anyways, Sasscat and I had this conversation about ballet wrap skirts because I've wanted to make some for myself for a while for to wear in my classes. She told me that she can never wear them because they're never cut long enough in the back to actually cover her butt, which is a huge oversight on the part of ballet clothing makers. I had the idea that for her birthday, since she lives far away and I can't go and celebrate it in person, I would instead sneakily get the measurements of her favorite custom fitted ballet skirt and then I would make a wrap skirt for her. So let's, enough of my talking, let's go see how I did the thing. I had already pre-washed my silk with textile detergent to prepare it for dyeing, and now I needed to iron it. The internet told me to use a pressing cloth on silk, but that didn't work well, so I pretty quickly abandoned that. Instead, I sprayed it damp and then ironed it on the silk setting, and that seemed to work pretty well. But you don't need to see the time it took me to iron three yards of silk. So we're going to skip past the worst of it. I found this free pattern for a ballet wrap skirt on the internet on spoonflower.com. Uh, it's not licensed for commercial use, and I promise you guys, I don't even have enough views to monetize these videos. So don't worry, Spoonflower, no money is being made. You print it out on normal printer paper and assemble it kind of like a puzzle by overlapping those little uh, lines you can see and then just taping it together. I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger because it's made for really small measurements. So instead of overlapping them, I'm just lining them up edge to edge to create some more space in the skirt. I just got the measurements from Miss Sasscat for her custom made, whatever it is her favorite ballet skirt is. She was able to give me the back length, center back length, the front length, and the side seam length. Um, apparently her skirts have a side seam because they're not wrap skirts. Um, she also was able to give me the distance from the center back to the side seam. Uh, which was helpful because now I know without actually taking a measuring tape to her because I can't do that. She's far away and this has got to be a surprise. I know where the shortest point on the side is going to be because this skirt does not have side seams and I'm like guessing at her waist size completely. And I don't even know if she's going to wear it at her waist. I think she actually wears her skirts at the high hip, so on the hip bones. I've taken those measurements and I've gone ahead and basically uh, sketched out a new curve for the bottom edge of this skirt because this was just one around and the reason she doesn't like wrap skirts is her favorite skirts seem to have like this super nice curve where they're longer at the back so they actually cover your butt and then shorter at the sides to make your legs look longer and then just a little longer at the front. She gave me 12 and a half for center back, eight and a half for the side seam, and then 10 and a half for the front. Um, I've added an inch to each of those measurements for the pattern because I've got a hem it and I've also got to get the binding slash tie on at the top. So here I measured out 12 and a half. There's my new center back length. Here I'm planning on adding like an inch over the fold to make this just a little bit bigger because I think this is originally designed for a smaller waist size than hers and I want her to have plenty of room in this. Um, so I've measured on the order of six inches and that's where I'm gonna put my shortest point at the side seam. Then from here it's about nine and a half inches along here, maybe even a little shorter in some places actually. I might redraw this a bit. I'm taking these measurements basically by um, lining up this curve or lining up the zero mark with the angle here. So there that's nine and a half. I want this to really be the shortest. And there's like a nice rounded curve into the center back. 
nine and a half length measurement at the sides. And she gave me a 10 and a half length measurement for the front. So I've made it more like 11 and a half towards the front. So I have room for hemming. I've got like a nice smooth curve sketched out. I'm pretty pleased with this. And now I'm gonna go ahead and cut it. to my silk on the fold, but with the back edge about an inch from the fold to add, you know, more space in the pattern. Newsflash for pattern designers and everybody else out there, ballet dancers come in all shapes and sizes, so you should maybe have your patterns for ballet clothes sized. Grumble, grumble. I cut it out, cutting around the pattern pieces, and then because silk is a little bit wiggly, uh, I trued a few things up once I took the pattern paper off. At this point, Browned nicely and it was time to take it out of the oven. It was oh so crunchy and delicious. Pardon the shaking, this is me holding the camera. So before I go and um, sew all of this skirt with the silk thread I bought, and um, this is just a clover silk thread found it on the internet, um, I want to make sure the silk isn't coated in anything because if I sew this whole skirt with silk thread and then the skirt dies and the thread doesn't, it's gonna look terrible. And I will wish that I had just dyed the fabric first, sewed it with purple thread after the fact. So I'm going to do a dye test on a piece of this thread. Um, I've already cut a little piece of the silk thread here. Um, how I'm gonna do this, I'm literally, I'm going to mix up an eighth of a cup of dye solution. I'm gonna soak the silk in it for a bit and I'm gonna see if the dye takes. Um, the solution they say is good is about, I've done some math on the proportions. I've got about an eighth of a cup of water and that's getting about a half of a teaspoon dye. This is a light purple color I got specifically for this project because Saskat's favorite colors are purple and more shades of purple and really anything that makes her look like a fairy creature, but especially purple. So I bought this one. It's called Wisteria. It's from Dharma Trading. I also have their neutral gray and ultraviolet. So I'll do some I'll do some playtime with those. So I've got that dissolved and then I'm also going to add some soda ash. I think the proportion of this would be like closer to an eighth of a teaspoon for what I need here, but I do want this to fix quickly and I'm pretty sure you can't actually like eh. I'm not going to worry too much about overdoing it. I'm just going to throw that straight in with the dye situation because this is not an actual attempt at, you know, proper dyeing. This is a test to see if this thread will actually take color. So in goes the thread. And this stops sticking to my fingers. Get it properly soaked in there. And then we'll just leave that be for a little bit. Um, while I go sort some laundry and then I'll come back and rinse it off and see if it's taken. It's bathroom, by the way. The silk thread has dyed beautifully. I've rinsed it in hot water and it's, it's taken the color super, super well. It's actually taken the color maybe even a little darker than I wanted to. So now I know use a slightly lower concentration of dye for this silk. But yeah, this has come out really well. I'm gonna call this experiment a success. I'm not gonna sew with this silk thread because the idea is it'll dye to whatever color of dye is taking on the silk around it. So this won't match when I actually go and crackle dye the fabric. The first actual sewing on this skirt was going to be doing the hem, which I intended to do by hand. To help out with that, I pressed all of the edges under. I had a go at doing it with my pressing plate, but these edges were so curved that that didn't seem to help at all, and I kind of just did my best by turning things under by hand. Bit of a pain in the butt, but you know, it worked. Fitness time! 
Um, I am here. I am gonna hand sew the hem on this. So I'm using a rolled hem stitch. Yulthiesen, I sincerely hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm really sorry if not. Uh, she did a really wonderful video on her three favorite hand stitches. So she's the one I learned this stitch from. Basically, you're traveling through the little fold of where you pressed your hem and then pulling it under. And then let me see if I can do this on camera. What should be able to happen is you pull on the thread here and the hem just rolls itself up and you get a nice little, neat little finish and you can't really see much from the other side just a lot of super super teeny stitches spaced a good distance apart so that's the finish i'm going to use but first i am going to eat a lovely delicious lunch of cheese and fruit and a pot of tea and wonderful fresh baked bread it is like i don't know four hours later although to be fair i did not spend the entirety of those four hours sewing but uh the hemming's done um it's 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 finished it's it's a thing that happened and I thought this would be quick and that I would just do long stitches and it would be okay and I was incorrect. Um, heads up, if you're gonna hem this by hand, going around curves, you need to use teeny, 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 teeny little stitches to get it to roll up correctly if you're doing the rolled hem stitch. Um, I figure it would be a similar thing if you were doing like a felled hem with a felling stitch. But yeah, like if I zoom in, Look how teeny those stitches are. They're so little. They're so close together. And that was the only way I could get the curve to happen properly. It's it's not perfect, but it'll it'll work. To be fair though, I don't think this would have been any easier for me on the machine. Um, I probably would have screwed up my material is what would have happened, and then I would have had to cut it out again, and it would have been a waste of fabric. And I hate waste of fabric. So we're just gonna go with this. What I am gonna do is wash and dry it again. So I might get the dyeing done this evening. I might get the dyeing done tomorrow. The reason I'm washing it and drying it again is because I've been handling it a lot and I've had like hand cream on and all of that stuff. And I don't want any oils from my fingers to prevent the dye from taking. So I'm gonna just wash it, dry it, and then dye it. And that'll happen either later this evening or tomorrow. I lied about immediately going to wash and dry it um, because I realized I needed to cut out my binding for the top edge and the ribbon ties. So here you can see me struggling probably way more than I actually needed to be struggling trying to cut out three bias strips on this very wiggly silk. I don't know what my problem is with being able to cut in straight lines, but it's really heckin' difficult. The ironing for the bias strips was also a little bit of a struggle, and I eventually gave up and used a bias tape maker. But seriously though, how are you supposed to iron silk that needs to be ironed more than once or in more than one place if you have to spray it damp every single time and you lose all the creases that you just created? Uh, someone please tell me in the comments, because I don't know. I cut the pointy ends off of all of the bias strips and then set to work sewing the ends together to make one long piece of binding that would form the top binding and the ribbon ties around the waist. It needed to be super long because it needed to go around Sarah's waist or hips, wherever she wore her skirt, twice. Unfortunately, my sewing machine decided to take this opportunity to inform me that it really, really did not like working with the silk thread. So once again, it's time to watch me struggle trying to figure out what on earth my machine is pitching a fit about this time. I think I've solved the mystery of why my sewing machine was being a little pain in the butt. 
butt about sewing on the silk thread. It's super slippery. And I was doing all these things like with the bobbin and trying to wind it tighter and worrying about the top threading and all sorts of stuff that was going on there and trying to figure out what it could be. And realistically, I think it's just, you have to actually do what you're supposed to do and hold the two little thread tails back here until it gets going. Cause otherwise it'll just slip and things will get super tangled. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna see if that works. And I'm gonna start trying to sew these ribbon ties basically that I'm making out of the bias binding. Uh, wish me luck. It waited until literally the very last stitch I needed to sew to jam on me, and that's fine. That is just fine. Because we have a skirt. Good morning. It's very, very early in the Snappy Dragon household. Um, you might hear roommate listening to music in the shower noises in the background. Sorry about that. Anyways, um, the skirt is dry. It's sitting on a towel over there. I'm being really careful that nothing touches it. Like, I'm not going to handle it with my bare hands or anything because I don't want skin oils to mess with the dyeing process. On cotton, I figure that's not an issue, but silk, uh, I don't want to chance it. I don't want to have the dye accidentally come out spotty. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use the low water immersion dyeing technique. That's basically my favorite dyeing technique ever. It gets you these really cool crackly patterns. Take whatever it is you're going to dye and you crumple it very tightly into a container. I'm going to try to get the crumpling fairly random because that is what determines your pattern. So I'm, I'm not even using a plastic cup, I'm using just this little tiny jar because the silk skirt is so small and it crunches up so little. Set the gloves aside for now. And then I can start measuring and mixing my dye. Um, by the way, I'm, I've been relying on the excellent Paula Birch's website for resources. Highly recommend, it's pretty great. Um, she's also got resources on doing what I'm doing with the type of dye I'm using, which is called fiber reactive dye. It's normally like people don't realize you can use it on silk. You can, it just makes the fiber a little softer and more matte. So for this silk habite and for something I want to be soft and floaty, it's just fine. And it's way less complicated than trying to do silk dyes and set it with acid and heat and all of that. So what I am going to do is I am going to mix up small amounts of dye solution. I want the skirt to be mainly like light purple and gray. So I am going to do like, hmm, how many ounces is this jar? I'm going to say it's probably eight ounces. So I'm going to do like, I'll do like half a cup of each color just to have some extra. I can do light purple. That can be gray. I know the light purple came out a little darker than I intended to when I did like half a teaspoon and it was an eighth of a cup of water. So now I'm gonna do one teaspoon and half a cup of water and it'll be half that strength. Okay. And then the gray, um, why don't I just do about the same amount? Uh, maybe one and a half because I was mixing the concentration you're supposed to use and I don't want it to come out like super, super light. I do want you to actually be able to tell there's gray in there. 
the gray I'm hoping will just give it a little bit more of this like ethereal quality. And then I'm gonna use a tiny bit of dark purple too. I almost like I would have gone and gotten an eyedropper to apply that with because I do want it to be really subtle. But I didn't feel like going and hunting down an eyedropper at this early hour of the morning. I haven't even had my coffee yet. All right, so there's a teaspoon of the light purple. I don't even like purple and I think that's a super pretty color. This is gonna be gorgeous. Saskat, I hope you're excited. You don't even know that you're getting something for your birthday yet. You don't even know what you're getting for your birthday. I hope you're excited anyways. Just mix those in until they're fully dissolved. That'll just have to do. And then I'm gonna mix like a quarter cup Yeah, quarter cup is the smallest this goes of the dark purple. And I'll do uh, half a teaspoon and a quarter cup. Yeah, keeping half a teaspoon. This I do want to be pretty strong. I'm only going to use it in a few places. And if you're completely unfamiliar with this dyeing technique, you'll understand what I mean in a second. And then the other thing that I'm going to mix up right now is some soda ash dye fixative. You're supposed to use one teaspoon of this per cup, total cup of water that's going in. So I think this, I've got a cup and a quarter of dye mixture mixed up. And then this is going to be, I think, another half cup. It's not all going to fit in here. Like, I know that. But I want to make sure I've got enough. So... I'm going to do like two teaspoons because that's the amount of water I've mixed total. So there's one and a half. There's another half. And that should be enough to fix all of the dye that needs fixing, even though that's not the total amount of water that's going to be in there. mix that really thoroughly. Don't let this stuff touch your skin, by the way. Don't let any of this stuff touch your skin. It doesn't get tested for skin safety because it's meant to go on textiles, not people. All right, now gloves because I'm going to be pouring. So here's the fun part. I've got my light purple and my gray, and I'm going to start just like pouring some of the dye mixture in, in various places. And you can already see the color starting to bleed together a little bit. And I want this to mostly be light purple, so I'm going to focus on that. But I do want a little bit of dark purple in there, so now what I can do, it's bleeding very quickly and I'm working fast right now, is take a little bit of that and actually just add a few spoonfuls here and there. And then a little bit more of this light purple just to, you know, cover everything up. Silk bleeds quickly. Normally you'd give it like up to an hour for the colors to bleed together. But if I leave it for that long, this is going to get very muddy. So I'm actually just going to, I've done this on silk scarves before, so I know it goes very, very fast. Fill the container the rest of the way up with soda ash solution. as much as I think I have room for. There we go. And now this needs to sit for one hour for the dye fixing to happen and then I'm going to wash it out with textile detergent. So I'm going to go make breakfast and have some coffee and get all this nonsense out of the kitchen before my roommate comes in. Bye. Which touch test do you want? Um, the second one. Hi, welcome back to the bathroom. It's been an hour. I have had coffee, I have eaten breakfast, and now I am going to wash the dye out of the skirt. So I have here some rubber gloves, I have a designated craft towel to clean up any spills or drips, I have textile detergent, and I have the jar with the skirt and dye mixture in it. 
So following the instructions for dyeing with fiber reactive dye, we're gonna wash this um, a couple times with cold water and the textile detergent and then once in really hot water. One of the reasons I've got the plastic gloves, the other reason is I don't want my hands to turn purple. Uh, so, you ready? So here it is, it's still wet so the colors are a little bit off. I'm gonna let this dry for a little bit and then I'm going to press it and get it in the mail. To be completely honest, I probably could have just ironed it straight away instead of waiting for it to dry, having it dry too much, and then needing it to spray it damp again to press out all of the creases. But eh, you live and learn. Hi! It is an absolutely beautiful day out um, and I am walking home from the post office after putting the skirt in the mail. I got myself some bubble tea and it's super, super pretty. So I'm walking home and getting my daily dose of extra vitamin D. See, my friend's birthday is in uh, just under a week and I shipped it today because it's going to her mom and it's going to be part of the surprise scavenger hunt thing her mom has organized. But it's getting organized, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess in absentia a little bit because her parents are going to be on vacation starting the evening before her birthday. So yeah, either way, everything's getting there in plenty of time. It's going to be super sneaky. I even didn't use my real address. I used my work address, which is in a little township nobody's ever heard of. So that should help. And it's, it's all done. We'll see how she likes it when it gets there. So my birthday was yesterday, and I'm supposed to open this shiny present from a tiny dragon. Uh, is pretty. Is black. Is satiny? I think. I think that a tiny dragon may have made me a ballet skirt. I think a tiny dragon made me a skirt. Uncertain. Was not a skirt. Might still be a skirt. <gasps> oh. It's a pretty dye thing. It's yup. My tiny dragon made me a very pretty skirt from a ballet classes. Cause she is the best he best dragon human creature ever. I hope you liked this video as much as Sascat enjoyed her skirt. For more silly sewing related uploads, like, subscribe, and click the notification bell, and find me at other places around the internet. Bye!